Have you ever looked at the initial reviews for the 1985 movie Clue? If you do, you'll find that they range from mixed to savage. Until recently, I didn't realize that Clue was received so poorly. It's been one of my favorite films for a long time, and when I discuss it with my friends, it usually always gets positive feedback, alongside a few criticisms like the jokes not landing or not aging well. But ultimately, how we see the movie today is almost a stark contrast to how critics and moviegoers alike saw it when it was released. Today, I'd like to take a closer look at this movie and speculate. Is this even a good film at all, or is it simply a bad film that we've come to love? You know, like Showgirls. We, uh, we all like that movie, right? I like it. And also, I want to discuss the mystery aspect of the film. How successful is it, and do we even consider it a murder mystery? Oh, and how can I forget? Does this movie warrant a remake? Holy cow, so many questions, so little time. So let's hop right into it. It's time to review Clue. I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Clue's screenplay was written by Jonathan Lynn and John Landis and directed by the former. Lynn had some previous experience with acting and went on to direct several movies after Clue, including My Cousin Vinny, and honestly, the rest of the movies he's directed were pretty notorious flops like Greedy and Sergeant Bilko. I like My Cousin Vinny though, that's a good movie. Landis' credits are probably more well known and include directing An American Werewolf in London and The Blues Brothers, but you know what I equate him with? Michael Jackson's Thriller. When I was young, I saw a making of for the music video and learned that Landis directed it, and for a long time it was the only thing I knew him for. I loved that making of, even though it spent way too much time focusing on Michael Jackson failing to get in a pair of sclera contact lenses. Ooh, ugh. Clue had been in progress for years, and the majority of it was already written by Landis. He really liked the idea of developing a movie based off of a board game, despite many people telling him this might be a case of building something from nothing, wherein that something doesn't actually have a story. Apparently, Landis fancied himself some sort of Agatha Christie because he wrote it as a mystery story with scandal and intrigue and blackmail and collusion, but kept getting stuck because he could not figure out a way to conclude the murders he had written, which we'll take a look at later in this video because I think this is an early misstep that contributed to the film's immediate failure. Well, we all make mistakes. So Landis, after figuring out that he was in fact not Raymond Chandler, started looking for another writer to finish the screenplay. Clue was pitched to five other people before Jonathan Lynn was considered, including Anthony Perkins. You know, Norman Bates. Lynn, who had previous experience in television, was eventually chosen by Landis and was in charge of coming up with the, at the time, four unique endings of the movie. Landis was supposed to direct the film, but got caught up in another project. He was directing Spies Like Us and wouldn't be available to work on Clue for another year. But then Landis got a brilliant idea. He would just let Lynn direct it, which seems like a terrible idea. It surprises me that Landis had so much faith in someone who had no previous experience in directing movies, especially since Lynn was brought on to finish the screenplay, not direct. But Lynn could not say no to the experience. Says Lynn in a 2013 interview with BuzzFeed, of course, anyone who's been a theater director would like to be a film director. I didn't have an ambition to direct something like Clue, but when somebody offers you a movie to direct, by and large, you say yes. The movie featured an all-star cast. For the most part, everyone was the first choice for their roles, with the exception of Miss Scarlet, played by Leslie Ann Warren, who had been nominated for an Oscar for her role in Victor Victoria, and Wadsworth, played by Tim Curry. Carrie Fisher was the first choice for Miss Scarlet, however, she entered rehab not long after accepting the role, and two people were originally considered for Wadsworth. Leonard Rossiter, known for several comedic television roles, and Rowan Atkinson, aka Mr. Bean, and this guy from Love Actually. Supposedly, John Cleese was also considered for this role, but I actually could not confirm that. Would have made an interesting choice, if true. Rossiter passed away in 1984 before pre-production, and Atkinson was not really known to American audiences at the time, so Lynn went with his longtime friend, Tim Curry, who appropriately already experienced being in a cult status film with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I think this was the most brilliant casting decision, because Curry and his Curryisms suit the enthusiasm of Wadsworth in the latter half of the film. Film. Though, I would not say this is peak Tim Curry. Peak Tim Curry is more like this. Or maybe even this. Space!
but you cannot deny the ball of energy that he transforms into for this role. It is truly a thing of beauty. He was also the first celebrity I felt attracted to in my youth. Colleen Camp played the voluptuous French maid Yvette, one of the characters who was not originally in the board game, and I'm embarrassed to say that I mostly remember her from Wayne's World. I'm ashamed of myself and I will make sure to go watch Apocalypse Now after this review. Eileen Brennan played the eccentric Mrs. Peacock, who earned an Oscar nomination for her role in Private Benjamin. Christopher Lloyd played Professor Plum, who was not yet known for Back to the Future, but more so for his role on the sitcom Taxi. Michael McKeon played Mr. Green, who found success with Laverne and Shirley. Martin Mole portrayed Colonel Mustard, and he actually got into show business in 1970 as a songwriter. He wrote a song for Jane Morgan called A Girl Named Johnny Cash, which landed on the country charts. But let's be honest, we all really know him as Mr. Kraft from Sabrina the Teenage Witch, am I right? Mrs. White was played by the amazingly funny Madeline Kahn. It was her role in Blazing Saddles that got Lynn to write more lines for her in Clue. And of course, leaving as Mr. Body. The guy with a pun for a name played Mr. Body, a guy with a pun for a name. I can't even. As a kid, I had no idea who this guy was, didn't recognize him from anything, and then in my teens, I discovered the punk band Fear, and I was like, holy shit, it's Mr. Body. This guy played Mr. Body. That's pretty badass. The tone on set was said to be mostly positive, if not a little too goofy at times. The actors and actresses were all comedians, naturals at delivering their lines, despite the fact that they were not allowed to improvise scenes. Clue fans will already know that the only improvised scene was Khan's now famous speech about flames, which is also one of the funniest lines in the movie. Though there were plans for a fourth ending, it never came to fruition as Lynn didn't think it made sense. Tim Curry vaguely remembers the fourth ending being about Wadsworth killing everyone, but neither him nor Lynn could remember. To quote Lynn, I have no idea what's reported online and I have no idea what the fourth ending was. It's really gone from my memory and I don't have a copy of the original script. A novelization based on the movie was published in 1985, written by Michael McDowell. His most well-known work is the screenplay for Tim Burton's Beetlejuice, and horror icon Stephen King once described him as the finest writer of paperback originals in America today. Jeez. A lot of people took interest in this novel because it includes a fourth ending. If you go by the book, then Curry's fuzzy memory of Wadsworth being the killer was correct. However, it's hard to say whether this book took some liberties with the ending and how accurate it was to the once quashed scene. Overall, it does seem like the fourth ending had mostly to do with Wadsworth being the murderer, but considering Lynn himself does not know the details, I'm not certain on any of the specifics. But if you can find the book at a decent price, I recommend picking it up. It's pretty fun. Wish I could afford it myself, but it's so rare, it's overpriced up the wazoo. The three endings that were kept were used as a theater gimmick. The intention was to show different endings at different theaters, and to see them all, you would have to go back and watch it again. This was a considerable failure. Though Clue had an amazing cast and what I would call an okay script with memorable comedic moments, it bombed and it was slayed by critics. As you may recall from my previous video about the history of Cluedo, Roger Ebert was not a fan of the film and criticized the lines and delivery of the actors. I think a lot of people are under the impression that the film's failure was primarily due to the theater gimmick not working, and that was a part of it, but many critics at the time were not impressed by the content of the movie either. A review from Time claimed, The colorfully named characters from Clue remain flat enough to be stored in a box. A few lines from Janet Maslin's review from the New York Times include, There is so little genuine wit to be found in Clue. And, the actors are meant to function as an ensemble, but that merely means that they often repeat the same lines simultaneously. No. 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 Kevin Thomas of the LA Times stated, Inspired by the Parker Brothers board game of the same name, Clue is more frenetic than funny, more strained than suspenseful or scary. In fact, it's not the least bit scary or suspenseful, but instead quickly grows tedious. And many of the reviews, of course, also criticized the gimmick of the theater endings. So, what went wrong here? First, let's take a look at the gimmick itself. I honestly didn't know theater gimmicks were still a thing in the mid-1980s. That seems kind of late to me. In fact, after Clue's failed gimmick, there were hardly any that followed. Clue may have single-handedly killed theater gimmicks. 
God. Throughout the 50s and 60s, horror film director William Castle was very known for his cheesy theater gimmicks, including a flying skeleton that appeared during showings of House on Haunted Hill and seats that would start vibrating during The Tingler. But these gimmicks really started to die out by the late 70s, and the ones that existed after that were never on the same level as a skeleton swinging from the rafters of a theater. That was awesome. So by 1985, I don't think anybody really wanted a gimmick. At least not the one that was on offer. This is supposed to be a murder mystery. I want, like, a corpse flung into the aisle, or blood oozing its way down the walls, or just something. Just something more appropriate to the story, something amusing. But instead, Clue wanted to do something more appropriate for Clue as in the board game. In the game, you always get different endings every time you play. It's never the same murder in the same room with the same weapon. It's always random. So for the movie, they assigned theaters random endings. You could get one out of three, and let's be real, they weren't all consistent in terms of quality. In fact, only one of those endings has Madeline Kahn's improvised flame speech. Imagine going to Clue and not seeing that amazing scene. That's a tragedy. It, it, the, f it, flame, flames, flames on the side of my face, breathing, breath, heaving breaths, heaving. And since the film's humor didn't land with a lot of critics, nobody wanted to go back and pay for another showing. Nobody cared about the endings. And this might just be me, but speaking as a self-proclaimed murder mystery expert, I like to have a solid ending. I have invested in a story meant to have a killer and I wanted to conclude accordingly. The last thing I want are randomized endings in my murder mystery movie, though later I will discuss why I enjoy the endings being in a row when it aired on TV. I would also like to discuss the murder mystery aspect of this film, so let's take a moment to do that. Clue is not quite a murder mystery, though it does have different solutions that get explained by the butler. It's also not quite a parody of a murder mystery either. Ladies and gentlemen, you all have one thing in common. You're all being blackmailed. The idea of blackmail is there, the characters are all very cunning, and people are being picked off one by one, but it's a little muddy because those are pretty basic elements. It is tempting to follow this movie and try to figure out who the murderer is, but you really can't because there are not enough clues. You could guess all you want, but it probably won't be based on anything that happened in the movie. This is not like an episode of Murder, She Wrote where there's like a button on the floor and it ties everything together in the end. No, this is not a well thought out murder mystery. It has predictable motivations like jealousy and blackmail, and I hesitate to call it a full blown parody because it's not really imitating something specific. I think a good example of that is the movie Murder by Death. That has very blatant references to famous characters in the murder mystery genre. But for Clue, it's a little harder because the characters are just kind of vague archetypes represented by a color. I think the fact that Landis struggled so hard to come up with the endings to his story was due to the mystery-driven narrative being too incohesive, with no real direction other than, some murders are gonna happen. I am your singing telegram. <laughs> I even think comparing it directly to Agatha Christie's and then there were none is somewhat inaccurate, even though I have heard people do it, including critics that reviewed it the year it came out. I'm going to have to respectfully disagree here. Yes, we have different weapons, interesting suspects with curious pasts, and murders are happening in a mansion. But if it slightly resembles anything Agatha Christie, it's because Cluedo is directly inspired by her work. Unlike Christie's novel, the main characters in Clue do not die, so I find the plot very very different. Some people do get murdered, but none of the main characters do, which is what happens in And Then There Were None. Clue is really just trying to be... Clue. It's about who killed Mr. Body, not about each player getting picked off one by one. We're trying to find out who killed him, and where, and with what. There's no need to shout. I'm not shouting! There are a few nods to Christie's work here and there, even if indirectly, because her influence just ends up everywhere anyway. But for the most part, I do think Clue is pretty different. I think the important thing to remember about this film is that the writers did want it to be a Clue movie with its own unique story that directly references the aspects of the game, while using some stereotypical murder mystery cliches, and that's why I've never really equated it with other murder mystery stories. In fact, I think it has a bit of an identity crisis going on. It's a couple parts comedy, a couple parts suspense, it has some satirical parts, but they get muddied by the restrictions of staying true to the game, and it does feature a lot of murder mystery tropes like Closed Circle. 
I consider it a comedy mystery, which is definitely a niche that doesn't get enough love. Point is, the movie's a little disjointed, to say the least. And then there's the question of whether the humor lands or not. That sounds like a confession to me. In fact, the double negative has led to proof positive. I'm afraid you gave yourself away. Are you trying to make me look stupid in front of the other guests? You don't need any help from me, sir. That's right. I recently polled my Twitter followers about their thoughts on this movie, and though the response was mostly positive, there seemed to be this consensus that a lot of the humor was weak. The joke about someone tracking dog poop at the beginning of the movie goes on for far too long, and if I'm honest, the movie does tend to slog for a little bit. With that being said, I do think the movie is filled with really sharp, witty humor, despite former critics saying it was really flat. Oh my god. She's going to faint. Sorry, cancer! I'll catch him. Oh. Pour into my arms. Oh. Sorry. And I'm not a slapstick humor type of person, but when I was a little younger, the scenes I thought were the funniest were Wadsworth getting clobbered with a candlestick, and this scene where he mistakes a shower knob for a doorknob. What's this? Another door. The movie stayed out of the limelight for a long time, but during the mid to late 90s, it was starting to get aired on channels like HBO and Comedy Central, and initially just served as good filler for time slots. The younger crowd saw it, latched onto it, and have not stopped quoting it since. I think a lot of people in my age group have a similar experience to mine when it comes to the discovery and eventual affection for Clue, so I'll just be telling you mine. One day, I was flipping through channels with my parents. I think I either flipped to HBO or Comedy Central and Clue was playing. My dad, who happened to really like screwball comedies and was a fan of the cast, told me to keep it on because he thought it was funny. So I did. And I adored it. This movie was made for a younger crowd. It's rated PG, so it's the ideal scandalous movie that preteens could actually watch, and I really appreciated the quick wit and really quotable lines. Husband should be like Kleenex, soft, strong, and disposable. You lure men to their deaths like a spider with flies. Flies are where men are most vulnerable. Right. I recognized Tim Curry from other roles, so I had a pretty immediate love for Wadsworth. And my dad was a big Bell Brooks fan, so I was also familiar with Madeline Kahn. Clue also happened to be my favorite board game, as it did have a bit of a resurgence in the 90s, so I was very into it. It helped that the movie now featured all of the endings in a row, with little screens separating each one, claiming things like, but here's how it really happened. The order of the endings makes sense to me, with the last ending being the most intense and also the funniest, and it really upped the energy level of the movie because the endings were where you saw Wadsworth running around in this sprightly state explaining who did it. Now you may see it differently, but this is how the film reads to me. I see the first two endings as the fake endings, meant to poke fun at murder mysteries with the sentiment of, look how many ways it could have happened. And then it flows into the final ending, which I always view as the true ending and solution for the murders. I really like how it plays out when it's watched like this. If you go to the theater and only see the first or second ending, it leaves you with this abrupt scene and it feels like it really needs to segue into something else. And without them, it makes for a much shorter, less exciting experience. The energy built up for the solution scenes are really satisfying after the often on again suspense of the first chunk of the movie. And that first chunk really only runs for an hour. With all three endings, it runs for about an hour and a half. So I think the movie really needs all of them to make it a worthwhile experience. As for the humor itself, your mileage may vary. There are a lot of one-liners that don't land, and some of the jokes did age pretty poorly. Most particular is the now odd in retrospect portrayal of Mr. Green, but mostly it's innocuous, and it's one of the most quotable movies I've ever seen. And now we're all on the internet, and I think that's a large component, on top of seeing it reran on television, that contributed to Clue's popularity. This movie was made to be quoted on social media and made into reaction memes. It is perfect for those things. I use clue quotes throughout my own videos. I'm not even sure I care that it's not the best mystery movie. And trust me, I'm stingy about that. But the genre was only a red herring. I mostly care about the fun time I have watching Clue or getting together with my friends and exchanging funny dialogue with each other. And also, I really do like the humor style. Wadsworth, am I right in thinking there is nobody else in this house? Mm, no. Then there is someone else in this house. No, sorry, I said no meaning yes. No meaning yes? Look, I want a straight answer. Is there someone else or isn't there yes or no? 
No. No, there is or no, there isn't. Yes. Please! It is on the corny side, and most of the characters are rather dopey, but I will never tire of 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1. Even if you were right, that would be 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1, not 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1. Okay, fine. 1 plus 2 plus 1. Shut up! Also, can I take a moment to express how absolutely amazing and gorgeous I think Leslie Ann Warren is? She's the standout in this movie to me. Nails every line and every facial expression. And I'm pretty certain she served as my first crush on a woman. Oh, you're a doctor? Uh, I am, but I don't practice. But practice makes perfect. Huh. I think most men need a little practice, don't you, Mrs. Peacock? As I write this review, I ask myself, did all of my first crushes come from Clue? That's weird. Another thing I really loved about this movie that I think goes underappreciated is the set. And yes, believe it or not, this is a set. It was built beautifully and really represents the rooms on the clue board. When I was young, I remember thinking how cool it was and I had hoped I could visit it one day. Alas, the only room filled on location was the ballroom and the exterior shots. And the music, particularly the music that plays in the beginning of the movie, is really memorable. When I hear it, I think, oh yeah, I'm ready for some clue. Let's do this. The music was composed by John Morris, who worked frequently with Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder. So what's the conclusion? Is this movie good? Is it bad? And we just collectively decided to like it again? Does it even matter? To answer the latter, nah. I will say that I don't think Clue's humor is as boring as critics initially said it was. I think it just needed to find the right audience, and it absolutely, 100%, needed those endings in the current order they're in. Clue has a really interesting past, the actors are a joy to watch, and despite its flaws, people have really taken a liking to it. And that's my review of Clue. Thanks for watching, everyone! I'd like to talk briefly about the remake that has been teased at the beginning of the year, potentially being written by the screenwriters from the Deadpool movie and starring Ryan Reynolds. I bet Jonathan Lynn would have never guessed that Clue would attain so much popularity that talks of a remake would be on the table. The idea for the remake was originally tossed around in 2011, when Universal claimed there was a new film being developed, but they eventually dropped it. The question is, do we need a Clue remake? Now, I'm not naive. I know how the world feels about remakes. I know people are purists and they feel that remakes disrespect the original content. I get it, okay? You're mad about remakes and you need people to stop shitting on your childhood. I understand. I'm also fiercely protective of certain movies and video games, so I get the apprehension and annoyance at the possibility that a studio might be leeching off an already existing idea without good faith. So I'm probably going to get a little flack for saying this, but I do think Clue could benefit from a remake. I'm not sure if the current film and development would be any good or any bad, but I'm not opposed to the idea of one. As discussed earlier, I do think some of the humor is outdated, and I would like to see that freshened up a bit, given a modern spin. We're all attached to the performers in the original Clue. I know. But I'm curious, I want to see it. Yeah, it could be terrible, or it could be amazing, or it could be meh, I don't know. But I'm not cold on the idea, and I will be keeping an eye on the development for this one. I hope you enjoyed this look back on the legacy of Clue. If you haven't seen it, I recommend checking it out so you can join me in the never-ending quote fest that always seems to happen whenever this movie gets talked about. And remember... This is war, Peacock! <sighs> Casualties are inevitable. You cannot make an omelet without breaking eggs. Every cook will tell you that. But look what happened to the cook! Hey everyone, thanks for watching my review of the 1985 movie Clue. If you like this video and want to support my channel, do consider paying me large sums of... I mean, checking out my Patreon campaign. Hit me up with some Clue quotes on social media, links are in the description, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next one.